Hey, what's going on guys? My name is Shane. For those who are new, welcome back if you're returning. Yeah, I'm a little bit nervous for today's video. Just a little bit though. So I'm gonna make sure that I say that I am not a true crime expert. I am simply a true crime fan. Please take everything I say as a speculation, allegation, or opinion unless it's been proven in the court of law or otherwise. I don't want to be sued. On Facebook, I was sent a message, and I'll read it here so you understand the context of today's video. Good evening. I wanted to ask you to please listen to a sermon by Jesse DePlantis at the end of January at Solid Rock Church. In his sermon, he made a statement saying that he knew how to get rid of a body so it would never be found. At the end of the sermon, Jesse asked Micah a question and JP cut him off saying she didn't need anything. In my opinion, it answers some questions about where her body was found. Micah was right-handed and I think it would be hard for her to unalive herself on the left side of her head. I truly believe that JP had planned this and had someone uh, unalive her and placed her in the river in hopes she would never be found. Uh, basically asked me to watch this sermon. The video was a little under, I think about an hour and 20 minutes. I watched it from the very beginning all the way till the end because he mentions that JP might have said something directed toward Micah at the end. Oh boy, I went through piece by piece and I made quite a bit of notes. Now, when I tell you my mind, my jaw dropped to the floor, okay? I was getting ready to film this video tonight and a couple new videos released of a mica update oh my gosh I was literally preparing to film this video and a new video dropped on YouTube I think I think the Robbie Harvey released it but I could be wrong saying that the original sermon that JP uh, performed a few days that Sunday oh it was the next day I'm sorry the next morning after finding out that his wife was deceased that video I believe was taken down and it's been re-uploaded though. And I only say it that way because I really wanted a chance to look at it and deep dive into it the way that I did with this sermon. I had just started watching uh, JP's sermon that he gave when he... <gasps> Oh, 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 that's why I'm a little bit nervous in today's video, so we're just gonna get into it. Now, I do have the full sermon. I am not gonna make you obviously sit through an hour and a half of footage. I'll link it down below if you wanna go take a look for yourself. We had covered Micah's uh, medical report. She never got an autopsy done, and she was cremated, I believe, before any uh, ballistics were reported. Now, was she cremated with her clothes too? Because the residue should have been on her clothing as well as the ballistics I was looking for on her hands. The gentleman who sent me the post said that it would have been hard for Micah to unalive herself on the left side of the head considering that she was right-handed because if that was the case and the entrance wound was from the left side of the head, yeah that would be really awkward to like reach around. No one would hypothetically do that. So I went back into the surveillance camera and I looked at where she was signing her name at the pawn shop and it does look like she was using her right hand. Now does that mean for sure that her dominant hand is right? No. I think she's just going to kind of pick up the pen and naturally sign uh, the way she's going to naturally sign. Even when she was worshiping at Solid Rock Church, um, it looked like when she was holding the microphone, most of the time it was with her right hand and she was raising her left to worship Christ. So based off of the, just the surveillance that I watched, I thought I could make an educated guess into saying that Micah was right-handed. So going back into that report and seeing that uh, the entrance wound was from the right side, um, that does line up more with an unaliving. I hate all these words for the record. Oh, it's tough because it's such a serious subject and then I'm out here saying unaliving. And one other thing I want to address too was the bruises on her hand because although when you're deceased, uh, and, and let's say you get uh, uh, pokia, there's no more blood pressure. So there's no blood that's going to be pushed to, the, to those open wounds. I wondered if the same thing was true with bruises, whether they could form after death or not. I truly had no idea. So I did look it up, and according to sciencedirect.com, it says, bruises are usually an antemortem phenomenon. However, bruises can form peri or postmortem due to the pardon my uh, gore here, but the passive ooze of blood out of blood vessels. 
gross. I had to get a water. One more quick, we're going to be talking a lot today. One more quick detail I wanted to point out that I haven't really, I'm sure creators have talked about this because this is not revolutionary at all. I thought it was a little bit strange though, looking at all the women that were involved in JP's life that we know about, up to Susie. Susie's an exception. I believe Susie is kind of just like there at the right place and he's... I hate to even use the word vulnerable on JP, but he's a lonely, you know, your boy is on his dating sites, sporting his wife's ashes around his neck. Uh, so he's clear, I, I don't think he's really, I don't think he's really going to be that picky at this point. This first popped up to me when the waitress came into the picture that he was asking bikini photos for. We also did a video covering her. When I first saw her picture, I said, oh, does he have a type? Because she looks a little bit like Micah with the dark hair and, and it's about shoulder length, the dark eyes, the light skin. You know, I, I'm like, that's a little... Okay, maybe that's a coincidence. But then I remembered that the schmuck is divorced. So I went up and I looked up his ex-wife, Allison. Allison? Micah. And, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm gonna have to look up her name again because I don't wanna be disrespectful. Was it Kat Katarina or something? I believe it began with a C. Christiana, okay, so I knew it was a C. So Christiana, do you not see it? But then you have Susie. We're gonna go right into the sermon again. I am not going to play the entire thing, but I'll play little snippets for you. Again, you wanna see it in its entirety, it'll be in the description below. My wife would be here, but she's pastoring the church. She's preaching this morning herself. And God has been so good and gracious to, <laughs> I had a preacher tell me one time, women, I, I shouldn't preach. I said, boy, you never been married, have you? <laughs> you have no idea what you're talking about. Apostle Paul didn't either, but anyway. <laughs> So the first 10 minutes I sat through this man basically talking about the books he's written. So real quickly, I thank you for coming and being a part of this service today. I brought some books and different things. If you'd like to get some of those real quickly, I want to talk about this. And God has been so good. And you know, I wrote this book called The Hidden Help. And this, and we talk a little bit about him and my own personal experience, The Hidden Help. And it'll bless you if you'd like to get that. I don't know where you, where you at, in the back somewhere? Somewhere. Back there? <laughs> okay. Anyway, hey, would you like to have this book? Yeah, let me give it to you. If you real quickly praise the Lord. What else you got? Uh, how many people are partners to my ministry? Are you a partner? Look at the people. Thank you for being so kind and courteous. God gives us themes all the time. And this is a theme that I had a few years back. And I decided to write a book, book on it. Your everything is his anything. He goes on for like the first 10 minutes talking about not only books that he's written, but also DVDs. So finally, about 12 minutes in at 11.58 is kind of when I make my first note. After he's done bragging and introducing himself, my first like, what did he say? Uh, he said several to, I mean several, one, two, three, four, at least four different times said something of this sort. My, my wife, she used to tell me all the time, Jesse, you never ask God for a need. I never will. It's a waste of spiritual energy. When God said to supply, how many need? How many need? How many need? Oh, let me get black with it. How many need, Lord? Then why are you asking God for a need? Why don't you tell him what you want? Uh, and it kind of crosses that, huh, I just don't think it was an appropriate time or a place to say something like that. Like, it, it, I'm Latin, but like I pass as Caucasian and even I was like, did he just say that? Like, it just seemed a little, I can tell you how it made me feel. I can't tell you how it made other people sitting in that church feel, but uncomfortable is the word that comes to mind. I couldn't have been the only one though, because at 12.05, listen to what somebody yells and there is a little bit of profanity. Well, I lost a few of you there. I'd be sitting in that church clutching my pearls. Can you imagine? In front of the Lord? Clearly someone else wasn't a fan. We're gonna jump to 15 minutes and 30 seconds when he says his second comment. For God loveth a cheerful giver. Now I like the next verse. And God is able, I call it the black verse, and the Lord is able. Hey, Lord Jesus. I said the Lord is able, 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 able. Look at the white people. They don't, they don't understand, they don't understand. <laughs> and again, at 18 minutes and 30 seconds. Having what? All sufficiency in all what? All, all what? Things. All what? It's your thing. Do what you want to do. 29.08, he says this. Mm-hmm, Lord. 
He gonna go black on that one. Yeah, Lord. Hey, Lord. I mean, uh, I am like thoroughly uncomfortable. It wasn't once. It wasn't twice. It was intentional. And I don't know if he was trying to be funny, but it just felt like there was a little bit of, like, I'm joking, but I'm not kind of thing. But because he's joking, he can kind of get away with being a little bit racist. You know what it... it I, I got that vibe. We had about like 20 minutes or so left. Right before the tithe, he brings up again about his jet. He brings up his jet quite a bit during this sermon. The value of a seed is far greater than the value of a sale. I gave away two jets. You know how much money it is? Millions. But when I sold, when I gave those, I got a jet out there. They didn't let you come out to the tarmac because you was in effort. Yeah. <laughs> Anywhere in the world, one stop. I'm going to try to hide in it. I mean, it's beautiful. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> I'm going to go get in it and wait for you. Yeah, come on. Hallelujah. I'm telling you. Could have sold his jet, but he just decided to give them away out of the goodness and betterment of God and his people, which all sounds amazing if I didn't think it was a bunch of baloney. Oh, and then he mentions how fast the jet goes. We were doing almost 700 miles an hour coming here. We were at 699 miles an hour. That's smoke air. Got to get back to New Orleans. Who cares how fast you're traveling for Jesus? This baby goes six ninety nine, not seven hundred, but six ninety nine. But then it's coming from your pastor that you're at church to learn about Jesus from, and that's, this guy is talking about how fast his jet is traveling. I don't think Jesus is very impressed. Again, my opinion: him basically saying, "I could have sold off the jets." pocketed a bunch of money that I don't need and I'm about to talk about why I don't think where I think he gets all his money and been, and been done with it but what good is that I've been out of debt since 1982 I have no con I have no concept of debt why <laughs> don't want to in the book of Romans says that oh no man anything but to love him ain't no shortage of money ladies and gentlemen if you don't believe that just go out to that airport out there they got a bunch of money sitting on that tarmac out there and when, uh, I never forget, I always get letters from the IRS. The you know, when you make, when you do well, they want to know, you know. And they've been to my place so many times and nothing. Can't find nothing, you know. It's all, it's clean. I don't touch your money, what you get. I don't touch any of that. But I asked the Lord, how do you want me to handle this? Because I thought about my friends in New Orleans, Chicago, New York, L.A., Kansas City. I make them an offer. They don't refuse. <laughs> they love me. I got a friend of mine said, don't make Jesse mad. He got friends. <laughs> no, they still love me. You know, so I just let my light shine. That's just that simple. And they tell me, I don't trust no priests. I don't trust nobody. I die with you. I trust you. Because I understood the life. You know what I'm saying? I lived that. But when I got born again, who, man. I said, man, I, got, I, I met Jesus. Wow. You mean you got religion? I said, I don't know what I got. Somehow. I feel like it's almost a way for him to get in like the good graces. I don't believe he needs the finances whatsoever. Instead of like a tangible financial value, it's almost like he's using it to almost buy the affection of, 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 of the community and the trust of the community because what bad guy would donate jets? <laughs> I mean, hello? Ba Boom, you popped that. Jesse even goes on to say about how some guy asked him, he says, Jesse, how do you make your wealth? Man asked me this the other day, you'll like this, John Paul. He said, but Jesse, how do you make money? I said, I don't make money. I generate money. He's kind of taking the L for not getting like a huge amount of money, which I don't think would really, would really benefit him anyway. I think he used it to benefit himself in like a, almost like a social hierarchy sort of way. Again, my opinion. At the end of the Facebook post that was sent to me, the commenter had said that JP had said something about Micah not needing something. Hold your offering up to the Lord. I want to pray over it. Hold it up. How many of y'all going to believe it a hundredfold? Shake it. I want you to get that. See, you need a hundredfold so you can pay cash for all whatever you need to do. Plus, Micah might want something. And like, almost without hesitation, this dude's like, No, she's okay. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, she's okay. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, yeah. No, she's okay. Like, what kind of loving husband? In front of the whole church, how are you not embarrassed? When Jesse is up there giving his sermon, at one point he's talking about other pastors that maybe he's acquaintances with or have visited their church or have done missions trip with, whatever the case is. 
He's listing off a couple pastors and one pastor that he said, now, Pastor John, where you at? John Paul. Okay, there are a lot of people afraid of me. He said, man, don't get Jesse Pence to come to your town. He'll suck all the money out the community. They said that about Jerry Savelle. They said that about Kenneth Copeland and Creflo Dollar and, and uh, uh, Bill Winston. I like Bill. He's a he steals all my sermons, but I like him. He's a blessing. <laughs> no, I give him a hard time. We're great friends. As soon as he said it, I'm like, Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Copeland. Why do I know that Kenneth Copeland had a video in 2023 go viral on TikTok? I start going down a rabbit hole. When Jesse is up here, I had to play it back a couple times. He says something along the line of, I was raised in La Costa Nostra. What? That, that's, that's what my mother told me. I was a heathen from hell. Do you understand? I was a heathen. I taught some things to the devil he didn't even know. I'm telling you, I was a heathen. I was raised on the streets of New Orleans. I was with La Cosa Nostra. You know what the La Cosa Nostra is? The mafia. Now, if you watch the sermon done by Jesse, he does mention going back down to New Orleans, and there is a, I guess, mafioso group. I was raised in that, man. My grandfather said, somebody mess with you. <laughs> Alligators got to eat. <laughs> Serious. What the Mississippi River for? However, I was just curious about the initiation process, if from what we know from movies and The Godfather, if the initiation would be any different than maybe what we think of it as. Maybe a more modern, less violent, or less... Uh, I don't think so. The problem is, is that there's no sign-up sheet. <laughs> like, the, I don't mean to cackle, but I just imagine, like, join the mafia. Um, there's no sign-up sheet, because that's going to go straight back to law enforcement. So there has to still be some sort of... You, you can't really retract your contract, or you, you have to be held accountable in some sort of way. Now again, I am not accusing uh, Jesse of any of this. I just wanted to look up what the initiation process was like, if it's changed over time or not. I read on Google a bit about a gentleman named Bernardino Vero. I'm going to, I'm going to try my best. Again, I'm not a history buff, so my, some of you might be like, you've never heard of it. I genuinely had never heard of this until I researched it, and now I have. Bernardino, he wrote a memoir in 1893. I should have given a trigger warning. So in his memoir, he writes, I was invited to partake in a secret meeting. I entered a mysterious room where there were many men armed with... Uh, guns sitting around a table. Also, I think I'm okay to say that word as, as long as I'm not saying like how to use it. In the center of the table, there was a skull drawn on a piece of paper and a knife. And in order to in be admitted, I had to undergo an initiation consisting of some trials of loyalty and the pricking of the lower lip with the tip of the knife. The blood from the wound soaked the skull. Another member in 1976 describes his initiation to be as invited to a banquet at a country house. He was brought into a room where several martial arts were sitting around a table. What? Mafiosi were sitting around a table, which sat a pistol, a dagger, and a piece of paper bearing this image of a saint. They questioned his commitment and feelings regarding criminality and murder, despite his already having a history of such acts. When he affirmed himself, Salvador Marina, the most powerful mo boss of the mob, so I should probably get that right, took a needle and pricked Brusca's finger and then smeared blood on the image of the saint. I said, Kathy, we got to be poor. Because you know, that's what Christians are. So we did. I got a job. I mean, if you want to eat a pizza and you're in Dallas and you want a Chicago pizza, you fly to Chicago on a jet and you fly back. That pizza costs $15,000. So, look at y'all. Oh, yeah. There's big money in the rock world if you're at that level. But to make a long story short, I gave her all my money and I was so glad because we were out of I mean, I drank a fifth of whiskey a day before, before I was saved. I smoked a little dope a week. Snorted cocaine, PCP, crystal meth. Took trips and never left my house. <laughs> Come on, just bah, insane nuts. Miracle of God, I lived. Miracle, I lived. Women, by the hundreds. But men love that. No, no, you don't even remember half of them. They want to know their name. Groupies, you know, just following you. They, who cares, you know? It's just the way it is. So I thought these few points were really noteworthy. Again, the constant racist comments, the complete disregard for Micah's feelings at the end of the sermon, um, in front of the entire church, I thought it was totally inappropriate. The bringing up of La Cosa Nostra, which 
we're gonna talk about something with that in next video. It was a lot of information just out of one sermon and seeing that after everything that we've learned. So if you guys enjoyed today's video, please let me know down below and I will see you in my next one.